questions are always in order. That's something a moderator usually says at the General Assembly, particularly after a long and difficult debate, encouraging people to ask questions to clarify what the issues at stake are. What kind of questions do you like to ask when you meet someone for the first time? The usual question, very common, that we might ask is, what do you do? And in asking that question about a person's job or training, um, is usually a way to find out a bit more about that person, uh, to find out what it is that they do. Occasionally it can be, if we're not careful, we can make assumptions based by the answer that they give. There are other questions we can ask people to get to know them. We could ask them, for example, what are you passionate about? What do you really love doing? And in some ways that's an even better question because it gets to the heart of who the person is. The reading in Matthew 16 is about Jesus asking two questions of his disciples. And the context in which he asks those questions makes them quite dangerous in some ways. He has taken his disciples north. Usually the ministry that he did, the most of it, was done around the area of Galilee. But he's taken them a good distance north to a city which has been renamed Caesarea Philippi. Under the reign of Herod Philip, who rebuilt that city and renamed it after himself and Emperor Caesar. So that's the context for the questions that Jesus is asking. Yesterday I, I filmed a short introduction to uh, this, this reflection outside Fife House. As it is the centre of power of local government within Fife. And as I stood there, I felt very safe. I didn't think that even if I asked a difficult question, that I was in any danger. The coat of arms that stands outside Fife House has the words justice and honesty on it. And I didn't feel in any danger, but if I was a Christian in North Korea, then the situation would be different. If I was an Uyghur Muslim in China, I probably wouldn't want to be asking dangerous questions. If I was an opposition leader in Russia, my predicament would be less safe, as we've just heard in the news about an opposition leader there. Asking questions and the context in which we ask them is important. At university, I was always told that asking a good question is an important thing too. So we ask all kinds of questions. I'm someone who likes to ask questions of other people. It's the way that I learn and understand about other people. Uh, but sometimes I've asked silly questions too. Um, I know sometimes I've even asked embarrassing questions, unintentionally sometimes. Like the time many years ago when I asked a, a woman um, who was expecting a baby when her baby was due only to, for this rather large lady to reply to me that the baby had been born two weeks before. You can imagine my embarrassment and trying to backpedal out of that situation wasn't easy. Asking questions is the way that we learn more. And Jesus asks this question. He, in the seat of Roman power, in this city of Caesarea Philippi, and he, in that place we visited last year on a trip to Israel, and even standing there in, with the ruins of what was the, the temple and the, the, play, the, the, the place of where the administration gathered of the, the, Roman, the Roman army, you can, there's still a sense of oppression in that place. There is an inscription which talks of Caesar as both saviour and son of God. And that 
was the context in which Jesus asked the question? In the shadow of the Roman Empire, in the headquarters of foreign rulers, that's the context that Jesus chose for his question. And the question, the first question was, who do people say that I am? Who do other people say that I am? And the disciples were quick to answer, Elijah, John the Baptist, um, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets that had been politically active in the past, and, but who are no longer with us. Those were the answers that people, the disciples gave that people thought Jesus was that they had come back. And Jesus presses them a bit further. This group of men who had given up everything, given up their jobs, given, come away from their families to follow him. He presses them further for the answer to the second question. And the second question was a bit more personal because it wasn't what do other people, who do other people think I am? It was who do you say that I am? Who do you think that I am? And it's Peter who, who gets it right. Peter is inspired and in that moment he says, you're the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Even in that dangerous context, Peter gave that very honest answer. Jesus praises him that, that had been an answer that had been inspired um, by the Holy Spirit for, for, for Peter to, to be able to say that. And that confession of Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the one on which the church is built, in fact. It's through, through faith, by grace, by grace through faith, that we are saved. And it's that confession of who Jesus is that is what is the foundational to our church. Now Peter had got it wrong many times in the past, but this time he gets it right. And in his usual way of, of stepping out in faith, he, he announces what he believes. And what Peter's actually saying is that in Jesus, he could see the activity of God at work. That God was using this person to further the kingdom of God. And even in this context of fear of authorities, fear of oppression, of retribution, Peter made the confession. Our own situation in this country, we don't live in such dangerous or the same kind of danger. But there is another danger that we live in with this virus, the coronavirus, in our own country and throughout the world. And that is our clear and present danger at this time. So how do we live in faithful ways, confessing who Jesus is? We live, when we live with such uncertainty, when we have no guarantees, even as Christians, that we'll protect, be protected from the suffering ourselves or within our families. I think it's no different what the external circumstances are. The call to Christians is the same as it was then. The confessing of who Jesus is, the leaning into him, the trusting upon him, is the secret to the transformation of our situation. The liberation that we need from fear. When we trust in Jesus, when we trust in him to work in our own families, in our own lives, in our own situation, to reveal to, her, to us the activity of God, even in the situations that we're in. These are the times that are transformational and liberational. Liberating. I'm just going to finish with the verse from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
Let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.